My name is Mike, and for the past 10 years, I thought I had a good thing going. My wife, Rachel, and I have been together for 13 years, married for 10 of those. We have two kids, a beautiful home, and a life that, to the outside world, probably seemed picture perfect. But the truth is, everything started to feel off a couple of months ago, and I'm just now beginning to realize that the life I thought we had might have been a lie. Rachel and I met through mutual friends when we were in our late twenties. She was vibrant, ambitious, and had this incredible ability to light up any room she walked into. I was drawn to her confidence, her laughter, and the way she seemed to know exactly what she wanted out of life. We dated for a few years, and when we got married, I genuinely believed that I had found my partner for life. Things were great at first. We had our ups and downs, like any couple, but we always seemed to come out stronger. I've always been the kind of guy who believes that if you work hard and stay committed, things will work out. So, I put in the work. I made sure to support Rachel in everything she wanted to do, whether it was her career, her hobbies, or her relationships with friends. I wanted to be the best husband I could be. But over the last year or so, things started to change. Rachel became more distant, more irritable. At first, I chalked it up to stress from work or maybe even a midlife crisis. She's three years older than me, and I figured maybe she was just struggling with the idea of getting older. But then our sex life, which had always been pretty solid, started to decline. At first, it was subtle, less frequent, more excuses. But then it all but stopped altogether. I tried to talk to her about it, but every time I brought it up, she'd either get defensive or dismissive. I'm just tired, Mike, she'd say. Or, it's not you, it's me. I just need some space. I didn't push it because I didn't want to make things worse. I figured she'd come around when she was ready. But then, a couple of weeks ago, something happened that I couldn't ignore. Rachel said she needed to go out to buy some things for the house. Now, this was odd because Rachel hates shopping, especially for household items. And she was meeting up with a male friend I'd never heard of before. When I asked who he was, she just shrugged it off. Oh, just a friend from work, she said, not offering any more details. The thing is, she spent the entire day getting ready like it was some sort of date. She put on makeup, did her hair, and wore the sexy underwear that she usually reserved for our bedroom. I didn't say anything at the time because I didn't want to seem paranoid, but it gnawed at me. That night, she came home hours later, and when I asked how it went, she was evasive, saying she was tired and just wanted to go to bed. I tried to probe a bit more, asking about this friend, but she got angry and accused me of being controlling. I need some time that's just for me, Mike. Can't you understand that? She snapped before going upstairs and slamming the door. That's when it hit me. This wasn't just a rough patch. This was something else. Something bigger. And for the first time, I started to wonder if Rachel was cheating on me. I didn't want to believe it. I didn't want to be that guy who jumped to conclusions, but the signs were becoming too hard to ignore. The next day, I went through our bedroom while she was out, looking for anything that might give me a clue as to what was going on. I'm not proud of it, but I was desperate. I found her phone hidden in her nightstand drawer, something she'd never done before. My heart pounded as I opened it up and started scrolling through her messages. There it was. His name popped up again and again in her texts. I knew the name because she'd mentioned him before, always casually, always in the context of work. But now I realized that he was more than just a colleague. The messages were flirtatious, intimate, and there were even a few that made my stomach turn. It was clear that whatever was happening between them wasn't innocent. I put the phone down, my hands shaking. My world was crashing down around me, and I didn't know what to do. How do you confront the woman you've loved for over a decade with something like this? How do you even begin to process the idea that your wife, the mother of your children, might be sleeping with someone else? I decided not to confront her right away. I needed more time, more evidence, and more answers. But deep down, I already knew the truth. Rachel was cheating on me. The life we had built together was a lie, 
and I was left standing in the wreckage, trying to figure out what to do next. The next few days after discovering Rachel's texts were a blur. I couldn't concentrate on anything. My mind was constantly racing, replaying those messages over and over again. I felt like I was living in some kind of twisted nightmare. Everything in our house, the photos on the walls, the furniture, even the bed we shared, felt tainted. The thought of Rachel being with another man, in our home, was too much to bear. I didn't say anything to Rachel about what I had found. I couldn't. I was torn between wanting to confront her and wanting to wait until I had more concrete proof. I felt like I was walking on eggshells, trying to act normal while internally, I was falling apart. Every time she smiled at me, every time she kissed me goodbye in the morning, it felt like a slap in the face. A week later, I was at work, sitting in a meeting that I couldn't care less about, when my phone buzzed with a notification. It was from our home security system. We had installed cameras a couple of years ago for peace of mind, especially with the kids. I never thought I'd be using them to spy on my wife. But there it was, an alert that the front door had been opened in the middle of the day. My heart sank. Rachel wasn't supposed to be home, she was supposed to be at work. And the kids were still at school. I had a bad feeling in my gut, one that I couldn't shake. Without thinking, I got up and left the meeting, mumbling something about a family emergency. I drove home as fast as I could, my mind racing with all the worst possible scenarios. As I pulled into the driveway, I noticed a car parked out front that I didn't recognize. My heart pounded in my chest, and I felt a cold sweat break out across my forehead. I already knew what I was going to find inside, but I had to see it with my own eyes. I couldn't ignore the truth any longer. I quietly unlocked the front door and stepped inside. The house was eerily silent, the kind of silence that wraps around you and makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. I stood there for a moment, trying to steady my breathing, trying to prepare myself for what I was about to do. Then I heard it. The unmistakable sound of a bed creaking upstairs, followed by a muffled moan. My blood ran cold. I could feel the bile rising in my throat as I forced myself to move forward, step by step, up the stairs. Each creak of the floorboards beneath my feet felt like a countdown to the explosion that was about to happen. When I reached the bedroom door, I didn't hesitate. I pushed it open, and there they were, Rachel and some guy I'd never seen before, tangled up in our sheets, completely oblivious to the fact that I was standing there. The room smelled of sweat and sex, and the sight of them together was like a punch to the gut. For a moment, everything went still. They didn't even notice me at first, two wrapped up in each other. Then Rachel looked up, and the color drained from her face. She pushed the guy off her, scrambling to cover herself with the sheets, but it was too late. The damage was done. What the fuck is this, Rachel? My voice was barely recognizable, raw and shaking with anger. I couldn't control it. The rage, the betrayal, it all came pouring out of me in that moment. The guy, tall, muscular, probably younger than me, jumped out of the bed and grabbed his clothes. He looked at me with wide eyes, clearly terrified. I'm sorry, man, I didn't know, he started, but I wasn't interested in hearing his excuses. Get the fuck out of my house, I snarled, taking a step toward him. He didn't need to be told twice. He grabbed his clothes and bolted out of the room, practically tripping over himself in his haste to get away. I heard him stumble down the stairs and out the front door, slamming it behind him. Rachel was left sitting on the edge of the bed, clutching the sheets to her chest, tears streaming down her face. But I didn't feel sorry for her. I didn't feel anything except pure, unfiltered rage. Mike, I'm so sorry, she sobbed reaching out for me, but I recoiled like she was poison. Please, let me explain. Explain? I spat, unable to believe what I was hearing. Explain what, Rachel? That you've been fucking some random guy in our bed while I'm out working to support this family? That's what you want to explain? She broke down into hysterical sobs, but it did nothing to soften the fury inside me. I felt like I was about to explode, my fists clenching and unclenching at my sides. 
part of me wanted to scream, to break something, but another part of me was too numb to do anything except stand there, staring at the woman I had once loved, who had just shattered my world. I, I never wanted you to find out like this, she managed to choke out between sobs, her words barely coherent. It wasn't supposed to be like this. Wasn't supposed to be like this? I repeated, incredulous. Rachel, what the hell does that even mean? You're married. We have kids. How could you do this? She didn't have an answer. She just kept crying, her shoulders shaking, her face buried in her hands. I felt disgusted, by her, by the situation, by everything. I couldn't stand to be in the same room with her anymore. I turned and walked out, slamming the bedroom door behind me. I went downstairs, trying to process what had just happened, but my mind was a whirlwind of thoughts and emotions. How long had this been going on? How many times had she brought him into our home, into our bed? And how had I been so blind, so stupid, not to see it? I needed air. I needed to get out of there before I did something I might regret. So I grabbed my keys and walked out the front door, slamming it behind me. I didn't know where I was going, but I knew I couldn't stay there, not with her, not after what I had just seen. As I drove aimlessly through the streets, the image of Rachel with that guy kept replaying in my mind. I felt like my entire life had just been turned upside down, and I had no idea how to fix it. All I knew was that everything had changed in that moment, and nothing would ever be the same again. I don't remember much of the drive, just that I ended up at some random park on the outskirts of town. I parked the car and just sat there, staring blankly out the windshield. My mind was racing, but at the same time, I felt completely numb. The reality of what I had just witnessed hadn't fully sunk in yet. I must have sat there for over an hour, trying to wrap my head around everything. The more I thought about it, the angrier I got. I had been blindsided, completely and utterly betrayed by the one person I thought I could trust above all else. And for what? Some cheap thrill with a guy who probably didn't even care about her? The anger kept building until it felt like it was going to consume me. I slammed my fists against the steering wheel, the pain in my knuckles a small relief compared to the storm raging inside me. I had to confront Rachel, had to demand answers, but I knew that if I went back to the house right then, I'd lose it. I needed to calm down, to get control of myself, but how the hell do you calm down after finding your wife in bed with another man? Eventually, I drove back home. I had no idea what I was going to say or do, but I knew that hiding out in a park wasn't going to solve anything. As I pulled into the driveway, I noticed the guy's car was gone, and the house was quiet again. That only fueled my anger. He had escaped, and now it was just me and Rachel, left to pick up the pieces of whatever the hell our marriage had become. I walked inside, and there she was, sitting on the couch in the living room. Her eyes were red and puffy from crying and she looked completely drained, but I didn't care. The sight of her just sitting there, like she hadn't just destroyed our life, made my blood boil. She looked up as I entered, her expression a mix of fear and guilt. Mike, please, can we just talk? Her voice was shaky, but I wasn't interested in hearing her excuses. Talk? I snapped, barely able to keep my voice steady. Talk about what, Rachel? About how you've been fucking some random guy in our bed? How long has this been going on? How many times have you done this? She flinched at my words, fresh tears welling up in her eyes. It was a mistake, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. I didn't mean for it to happen, Mike. I'm so sorry. A mistake? I laughed bitterly. This wasn't a mistake, Rachel. A mistake is forgetting to pick up milk on the way home. What you did was a choice, a deliberate, conscious choice to betray me, to betray our family. How could you? She started sobbing again, but I wasn't moved. I felt like I was standing outside of myself, watching this whole thing unfold like it was happening to someone else. It was surreal, like I was trapped in a nightmare that I couldn't wake up from. I didn't want this to happen, she cried, her hands trembling as she wiped at her tears. I don't know what I was thinking. 
I've been so lonely, Mike. You're always at work, always busy, and I. Don't you dare blame this on me. I roared, cutting her off. You think I work because I want to be away from you? From our kids? I work to support this family, to give us a good life. And while I'm busting my ass, you're here screwing around with some other guy? How long has this been going on, Rachel? She hesitated, her eyes darting around the room as if she was looking for an escape. It's been a few months, she finally admitted, her voice so quiet I could barely hear her. A few months? I repeated, feeling like I had been punched in the gut. Jesus Christ, Rachel. All this time, you've been lying to me, lying to our kids, pretending like everything was fine? How could you be so heartless? It wasn't like that, she insisted, her voice desperate. It just happened, Mike. I didn't plan it, and I never wanted to hurt you. Never wanted to hurt me? I echoed, incredulous. What the hell did you think was going to happen when I found out? Did you think I'd just shrug it off, that I'd be okay with this? She shook her head, her tears falling freely now. No, I, I don't know. I wasn't thinking. I was just so lonely, Mike. We haven't been connecting, and I felt like you didn't love me anymore. So you went out and found someone else to fuck? I snapped, my anger flaring up again. You think that's the solution to our problems? Instead of talking to me, instead of working on our marriage, you just go out and cheat? Rachel's sobs grew louder, but I didn't care. I was too angry, too hurt, to feel any sympathy for her. She had done this, she had destroyed our marriage, not me. And now she was sitting there, crying and trying to make herself out to be the victim. You've been cheating on me for months, Rachel. Months. I yelled, pacing back and forth in the living room, trying to burn off the rage that was threatening to consume me. And what about the kids? What the hell would they think if they knew what you've been doing? Please, Mike, don't tell them, she begged, her voice breaking. They don't need to know. We can work through this, we can fix this. Fix this? I interrupted, stopping in my tracks to glare at her. How the hell are we supposed to fix this, Rachel? You've destroyed any trust one had in you. How do we come back from that? She didn't have an answer. She just sat there, crying, as if her tears would somehow make this all go away. But it wouldn't. Nothing she could say or do would ever make this right. I felt like I was drowning in a sea of emotions, anger, betrayal, heartbreak. I didn't know what to do, how to move forward. Part of me wanted to pack up my things and leave, to just walk away and never look back. But another part of me, the part that still loved her, despite everything, wanted to find a way to make this work, to somehow rebuild what we had lost. But how do you rebuild after something like this? How do you forgive someone who has hurt you so deeply, who has shattered your trust into a million pieces? I didn't have any answers, but I knew one thing for sure, things could never go back to the way they were. Our marriage was hanging by a thread, and I wasn't sure if it was worth saving. Mike, please, Rachel whispered, her voice trembling. I'll do anything to make this right. Just don't leave. Don't throw away everything we've built together. I stared at her, my mind racing. I wanted to scream at her, to lash out, but I was too tired, too drained. I felt like I had aged ten years in the past hour, and all I wanted to do was crawl into bed and, my name is Mike, and for the past ten years, I thought I had a good thing going. My wife, Rachel, and I have been together for thirteen years, married for ten of those. We have two kids, a beautiful home, and a life that, to the outside world, probably seemed picture perfect. But the truth is, everything started to feel off a couple of months ago, and I'm just now beginning to realize that the life I thought we had might have been a lie. Rachel and I met through mutual friends when we were in our late twenties. She was vibrant, ambitious, and had this incredible ability to light up any room she walked into. I was drawn to her confidence, her laughter, and the way she seemed to know exactly what she wanted out of life. We dated for a few years, and when we got married, I genuinely believed that I had found my partner for life. 
things were great at first. We had our ups and downs, like any couple, but we always seemed to come out stronger. I've always been the kind of guy who believes that if you work hard and stay committed, things will work out. So, I put in the work. I made sure to support Rachel in everything she wanted to do, whether it was her career, her hobbies, or her relationships with friends. I wanted to be the best husband I could be. But over the last year or so, things started to change. Rachel became more distant, more irritable. At first, I chalked it up to stress from work or maybe even a midlife crisis. She's three years older than me, and I figured maybe she was just struggling with the idea of getting older. But then our sex life, which had always been pretty solid, started to decline. At first, it was subtle, less frequent, more excuses. But then it all but stopped altogether. I tried to talk to her about it, but every time I brought it up, she'd either get defensive or dismissive. I'm just tired, Mike, she'd say. Or, it's not you, it's me. I just need some space. I didn't push it because I didn't want to make things worse. I figured she'd come around when she was ready. But then, a couple of weeks ago, something happened that I couldn't ignore. Rachel said she needed to go out to buy some things for the house. Now, this was odd because Rachel hates shopping, especially for household items. And she was meeting up with a male friend I'd never heard of before. When I asked who he was, she just shrugged it off. Oh, just a friend from work, she said, not offering any more details. The thing is, she spent the entire day getting ready like it was some sort of date. She put on makeup, did her hair, and wore the sexy underwear that she usually reserved for our bedroom. I didn't say anything at the time because I didn't want to seem paranoid, but it gnawed at me. That night, she came home hours later, and when I asked how it went, she was evasive, saying she was tired and just wanted to go to bed. I tried to probe a bit more, asking about this friend, but she got angry and accused me of being controlling. I need some time that's just for me, Mike. Can't you understand that? She snapped before going upstairs and slamming the door. That's when it hit me. This wasn't just a rough patch. This was something else. Something bigger. And for the first time, I started to wonder if Rachel was cheating on me. I didn't want to believe it. I didn't want to be that guy who jumped to conclusions, but the signs were becoming too hard to ignore. The next day, I went through our bedroom while she was out, looking for anything that might give me a clue as to what was going on. I'm not proud of it, but I was desperate. I found her phone hidden in her nightstand drawer, something she'd never done before. My heart pounded as I opened it up and started scrolling through her messages. There it was. His name popped up again and again in her texts. I knew the name because she'd mentioned him before, always casually, always in the context of work. But now I realized that he was more than just a colleague. The messages were flirtatious, intimate, and there were even a few that made my stomach turn. It was clear that whatever was happening between them wasn't innocent. I put the phone down, my hands shaking. My world was crashing down around me, and I didn't know what to do. How do you confront the woman you've loved for over a decade with something like this? How do you even begin to process the idea that your wife, the mother of your children, might be sleeping with someone else? I decided not to confront her right away. I needed more time, more evidence, and more answers. But deep down, I already knew the truth. Rachel was cheating on me. The life we had built together was a lie, and I was left standing in the wreckage, trying to figure out what to do next. The next few days after discovering Rachel's texts were a blur. I couldn't concentrate on anything. My mind was constantly racing, replaying those messages over and over again. I felt like I was living in some kind of twisted nightmare. Everything in our house, the photos on the walls, the furniture, even the bed we shared, felt tainted. The thought of Rachel being with another man, in our home, was too much to bear. I didn't say anything to Rachel about what I had found. I couldn't. I was torn between wanting to confront her and wanting to wait until I had more concrete proof. I felt like I was walking on eggshells, trying to act normal while internally, I was falling apart. 
every time she smiled at me, every time she kissed me goodbye in the morning, it felt like a slap in the face. A week later, I was at work, sitting in a meeting that I couldn't care less about, when my phone buzzed with a notification. It was from our home security system. We had installed cameras a couple of years ago for peace of mind, especially with the kids. I never thought I'd be using them to spy on my wife. But there it was, an alert that the front door had been opened in the middle of the day. My heart sank. Rachel wasn't supposed to be home, she was supposed to be at work. And the kids were still at school. I had a bad feeling in my gut, one that I couldn't shake. Without thinking, I got up and left the meeting, mumbling something about a family emergency. I drove home as fast as I could, my mind racing with all the worst possible scenarios. As I pulled into the driveway, I noticed a car parked out front that I didn't recognize. My heart pounded in my chest, and I felt a cold sweat break out across my forehead. I already knew what I was going to find inside, but I had to see it with my own eyes. I couldn't ignore the truth any longer. I quietly unlocked the front door and stepped inside. The house was eerily silent, the kind of silence that wraps around you and makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. I stood there for a moment, trying to steady my breathing, trying to prepare myself for what I was about to do. Then I heard it. The unmistakable sound of a bed creaking upstairs, followed by a muffled moan. My blood ran cold. I could feel the bile rising in my throat as I forced myself to move forward, step by step, up the stairs. Each creak of the floorboards beneath my feet felt like a countdown to the explosion that was about to happen. When I reached the bedroom door, I didn't hesitate. I pushed it open, and there they were, Rachel and some guy I'd never seen before, tangled up in our sheets, completely oblivious to the fact that I was standing there. The room smelled of sweat and sex, and the sight of them together was like a punch to the gut. For a moment, everything went still. They didn't even notice me at first, too wrapped up in each other. Then Rachel looked up, and the color drained from her face. She pushed the guy off her, scrambling to cover herself with the sheets, but it was too late. The damage was done. What the fuck is this, Rachel? My voice was barely recognizable, raw and shaking with anger. I couldn't control it. The rage, the betrayal, it all came pouring out of me in that moment. The guy, tall, muscular, probably younger than me, jumped out of the bed and grabbed his clothes. He looked at me with wide eyes, clearly terrified. I'm sorry, man, I didn't know, he started, but I wasn't interested in hearing his excuses. Get the fuck out of my house, I snarled, taking a step toward him. He didn't need to be told twice. He grabbed his clothes and bolted out of the room, practically tripping over himself in his haste to get away. I heard him stumble down the stairs and out the front door, slamming it behind him. Rachel was left sitting on the edge of the bed, clutching the sheets to her chest, tears streaming down her face. But I didn't feel sorry for her. I didn't feel anything except pure, unfiltered rage. Mike, I'm so sorry, she sobbed, reaching out for me but I recoiled like she was poison. Please, let me explain. Explain? I spat, unable to believe what I was hearing. Explain what, Rachel? That you've been fucking some random guy in our bed while I'm out working to support this family? That's what you want to explain? She broke down into hysterical sobs, but it did nothing to soften the fury inside me. I felt like I was about to explode, my fists clenching and unclenching at my sides. Part of me wanted to scream, to break something, but another part of me was too numb to do anything except stand there, staring at the woman I had once loved, who had just shattered my world. I, I never wanted you to find out like this, she managed to choke out between sobs, her words barely coherent. It wasn't supposed to be like this. Wasn't supposed to be like this? I repeated, incredulous. Rachel, what the hell does that even mean? You're married. We have kids. How could you do this? She didn't have an answer. She just kept crying, her shoulders shaking, her face buried in her hands. I felt disgusted, by her, by the situation, by everything. 
I couldn't stand to be in the same room with her anymore. I turned and walked out, slamming the bedroom door behind me. I went downstairs, trying to process what had just happened, but my mind was a whirlwind of thoughts and emotions. How long had this been going on? How many times had she brought him into our home, into our bed? And how had I been so blind, so stupid, not to see it? I needed air. I needed to get out of there before I did something I might regret. So I grabbed my keys and walked out the front door, slamming it behind me. I didn't know where I was going, but I knew I couldn't stay there, not with her, not after what I had just seen. As I drove aimlessly through the streets, the image of Rachel with that guy kept replaying in my mind. I felt like my entire life had just been turned upside down, and I had no idea how to fix it. All I knew was that everything had changed in that moment, and nothing would ever be the same again. I don't remember much of the drive, just that I ended up at some random park on the outskirts of town. I parked the car and just sat there, staring blankly out the windshield. My mind was racing, but at the same time, I felt completely numb. The reality of what I had just witnessed hadn't fully sunk in yet. I must have sat there for over an hour, trying to wrap my head around everything. The more I thought about it, the angrier I got. I had been blindsided, completely and utterly betrayed by the one person I thought I could trust above all else. And for what? Some cheap thrill with a guy who probably didn't even care about her? The anger kept building until it felt like it was going to consume me. I slammed my fists against the steering wheel, the pain in my knuckles a small relief compared to the storm raging inside me. I had to confront Rachel, had to demand answers, but I knew that if I went back to the house right then, I'd lose it. I needed to calm down, to get control of myself, but how the hell do you calm down after finding your wife in bed with another man? Eventually, I drove back home. I had no idea what I was going to say or do, but I knew that hiding out in a park wasn't going to solve anything. As I pulled into the driveway, I noticed the guy's car was gone, and the house was quiet again. That only fueled my anger. He had escaped, and now it was just me and Rachel, left to pick up the pieces of whatever the hell our marriage had become. I walked inside, and there she was, sitting on the couch in the living room. Her eyes were red and puffy from crying, and she looked completely drained, but I didn't care. The sight of her just sitting there, like she hadn't just destroyed our life, made my blood boil. She looked up as I entered, her expression a mix of fear and guilt. Mike, please, can we just talk? Her voice was shaky, but I wasn't interested in hearing her excuses. Talk? I snapped, barely able to keep my voice steady. Talk about what, Rachel? About how you've been fucking some random guy in our bed? How long has this been going on? How many times have you done this? She flinched at my words, fresh tears welling up in her eyes. It was a mistake, she said her voice barely above a whisper. I didn't mean for it to happen, Mike. I'm so sorry. A mistake? I laughed bitterly. This wasn't a mistake, Rachel. A mistake is forgetting to pick up milk on the way home. What you did was a choice, a deliberate, conscious choice to betray me, to betray our family. How could you? She started sobbing again, but I wasn't moved. I felt like I was standing outside of myself, watching this whole thing unfold like it was happening to someone else. It was surreal, like I was trapped in a nightmare that I couldn't wake up from. I didn't want this to happen, she cried, her hands trembling as she wiped at her tears. I don't know what I was thinking. I've been so lonely, Mike. You're always at work, always busy, and I. Don't you dare blame this on me. I roared, cutting her off. You think I work because I want to be away from you? From our kids? I work to support this family, to give us a good life. And while I'm busting my ass, you're here screwing around with some other guy? How long has this been going on, Rachel? She hesitated, her eyes darting around the room as if she was looking for an escape. It's been a few months, she finally admitted, her voice so quiet I could barely hear her. A few months? I repeated, feeling like I had been punched in the gut. Jesus Christ, Rachel. 
All this time, you've been lying to me, lying to our kids, pretending like everything was fine? How could you be so heartless? It wasn't like that, she insisted, her voice desperate. It just happened, Mike. I didn't plan it, and I never wanted to hurt you. Never wanted to hurt me? I echoed, incredulous. What the hell did you think was going to happen when I found out? Did you think I'd just shrug it off, that I'd be okay with this? She shook her head, her tears falling freely now. No, I, I don't know. I wasn't thinking. I was just so lonely, Mike. We haven't been connecting, and I felt like you didn't love me anymore. So you went out and found someone else to fuck? I snapped, my anger flaring up again. You think that's the solution to our problems? Instead of talking to me, instead of working on our marriage, you just go out and cheat? Rachel's sobs grew louder, but I didn't care. I was too angry, too hurt, to feel any sympathy for her. She had done this, she had destroyed our marriage, not me. And now she was sitting there, crying and trying to make herself out to be the victim. You've been cheating on me for months, Rachel. Months. I yelled, pacing back and forth in the living room, trying to burn off the rage that was threatening to consume me. And what about the kids? What the hell would they think if they knew what you've been doing? Please, Mike, don't tell them, she begged, her voice breaking. They don't need to know. We can work through this, we can fix this. Fix this? I interrupted, stopping in my tracks to glare at her. How the hell are we supposed to fix this, Rachel? You've destroyed any trust one had in you. How do we come back from that? She didn't have an answer. She just sat there, crying, as if her tears would somehow make this all go away. But it wouldn't. Nothing she could say or do would ever make this right. I felt like I was drowning in a sea of emotions, anger, betrayal, heartbreak. I didn't know what to do, how to move forward. Part of me wanted to pack up my things and leave, to just walk away and never look back. But another part of me, the part that still loved her, despite everything, wanted to find a way to make this work, to somehow rebuild what we had lost. But how do you rebuild after something like this? How do you forgive someone who has hurt you so deeply, who has shattered your trust into a million pieces? I didn't have any answers, but I knew one thing for sure, things could never go back to the way they were. Our marriage was hanging by a thread, and I wasn't sure if it was worth saving. Mike, please, Rachel whispered, her voice trembling. I'll do anything to make this right. Just don't leave. Don't throw away everything we've built together. I stared at her, my mind racing. I wanted to scream at her, to lash out, but I was too tired, too drained. I felt like I had aged ten years in the past hour, and all I wanted to do was crawl into bed and forget this had ever happened. I don't know if I can do this, Rachel, I finally said, my voice hollow. I don't know if I can ever trust you again. She reached out for me, her eyes pleading, but I took a step back. I couldn't bear to be near her right now, not after everything I had just seen and heard. Mike, please, she begged, her voice breaking. I love you. I don't want to lose you. Then you should have thought of that before you fucked another man in our bed, I replied coldly, turning away from her. I walked out of the room, out of the house, needing to get as far away from her as possible. The cool evening air hit me like a slap to the face, but it did nothing to clear my mind. I felt like I was on the edge of a cliff, teetering on the brink, and I had no idea whether I should jump or step back. I spent the rest of the night driving around aimlessly, trying to process everything that had happened. But no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't make sense of it. I couldn't understand how the woman I had loved for so long could betray me like this. By the time I finally made it back home, it was late. The house was dark, and Rachel was already in bed. I didn't go to our bedroom. Instead, I grabbed a blanket and crashed on the couch, staring up at the ceiling and wondering how the hell I was going to get through this. As I lay there, the events of the day playing over and over in my mind, I knew that our marriage would never be the same again. The trust was gone, shattered beyond repair, 
and all that was left was the question of what to do next. I had no idea where we would go from here, but one thing was certain, the road ahead was going to be long and painful, and I wasn't sure if I had the strength to walk it. The next morning, I woke up on the couch, my body aching from the uncomfortable position I had slept in. The events of the previous day came crashing back into my mind, and for a moment, I wished I could just close my eyes and make it all disappear. But there was no escaping it. Rachel's betrayal was real, and I had to face it head on. The house was quiet, almost eerily so. I glanced at the clock on the wall, it was still early, and the kids hadn't woken up yet. Part of me wanted to avoid Rachel altogether, to not even look at her, but I knew I couldn't hide from this forever. I needed to make a decision about what to do next. I walked into the kitchen, and there she was, sitting at the table with a cup of coffee in her hands. Her eyes were bloodshot, and she looked like she hadn't slept a wink. The sight of her made my anger flare up again, but I kept it in check. I wasn't ready to explode just yet. I had to be smart about this. Morning, I muttered, not really knowing what else to say. The tension in the room was palpable. Mike, she began, her voice barely above a whisper, I know you're still angry, and I don't blame you. But please, can we talk about this? We need to figure out what to do. I ignored her question, instead focusing on making myself a cup of coffee. The mundane act of brewing coffee gave me a moment to collect my thoughts, to think about how I wanted to approach this situation. I wasn't sure if I wanted to talk things through, forgive her, or just walk away. But then, as I stirred my coffee, something inside me snapped. All the pain, anger, and betrayal that I had been holding back came flooding to the surface. I couldn't just let this go. I couldn't just sit down and have a civil conversation with the woman who had torn my heart out. I turned to face her, my jaw clenched. You want to talk, Rachel? Fine, let's talk. But first, tell me this, how many times did you fuck him in our bed? How many times did you let him touch you while I was out working, providing for this family? Her face crumpled, and she began to sob again, but I didn't care. I was done with her tears. I wanted answers, and I wanted her to feel a fraction of the pain she had caused me. Mike, please, she choked out, I already told you, it was a mistake. I didn't mean for any of this to happen. A mistake? I repeated, my voice laced with venom. You've been fucking him for months, Rachel. That's not a mistake, that's a goddamn affair. She didn't have a response. She just sat there, crying, and it made me sick to my stomach. I couldn't stand the sight of her, but at the same time, I couldn't tear my eyes away. How could she have done this to us? How could she have done this to me? I needed to hurt her. I needed her to feel the same devastation that I was feeling. And that's when the idea hit me, if she was willing to throw away our marriage for some cheap thrill, then maybe it was time for her to see what it felt like to be on the other side. I walked over to the table and leaned down, getting in her face. You want to know what's going to happen now, Rachel? I said, my voice low and dangerous. I'm going to make sure you regret every single second you spent with that piece of shit. You think you can just fuck around and everything will be fine? You've got another thing coming. Her eyes widened in fear, and she shook her head. Mike, no, please, don't do anything rash. We can work through this. I'll do anything. Anything? I scoffed. It's too late for that, Rachel. The damage is done. But don't worry, I'm not going to hurt you. No, that would be too easy. I'm going to make sure you suffer in ways you can't even imagine. She looked genuinely terrified now, but I was past the point of caring. I wanted her to feel the full weight of her betrayal, to understand that there were consequences for her actions. You want to know what it's like to be betrayed? I continued, my voice cold and emotionless. Fine. Let's play that game. I turned and walked out of the kitchen, my mind racing with plans. If she thought she could destroy our marriage and get away with it, she was dead wrong. I was going to make sure she paid for what she had done, and I wasn't going to let her off easy. First things first, 
I needed to figure out how to hit her where it hurt the most. And what better way than to go after the life she loved so much, the perfect little life she had built for herself, with her job, her friends, her reputation. I was going to take it all away from her, piece by piece, until there was nothing left. Later that day, while the kids were still at school, I decided to start with the one thing I knew would devastate her the most, her social circle. Rachel was the kind of woman who thrived on being liked, who cared deeply about what other people thought of her. She had a close-knit group of friends, and they were all about appearances. The perfect wife, the perfect mother, the perfect life. But what would happen if they knew the truth? If they knew that Rachel wasn't as perfect as she pretended to be? I pulled out my phone and started texting her friends, one by one. I didn't care if it was petty or vindictive. I was beyond that now. I wanted to ruin her, to make her feel as small and worthless as she had made me feel. Hey, just thought you should know, Rachel's been cheating on me for months. Found out yesterday. Not sure what I'm going to do yet, but I thought her friends should know the truth. Thanks. The messages went out, and within minutes, my phone started blowing up with responses. Some were shocked, others tried to offer sympathy, but all of them were outraged. Rachel had built her entire identity around being the perfect wife and mother, and now that image was shattered. I knew it would only be a matter of time before the rumor spread like wildfire, and Rachel's carefully crafted life would come crumbling down around her. But that was only the beginning. I wasn't done yet. Next, I decided to hit her where it would hurt financially. Rachel was the primary breadwinner in our family, and she took great pride in her job. She loved being successful, being the one who brought home the bigger paycheck. But how would she feel if she suddenly found herself unemployed? If the job she loved so much was ripped away from her? I knew exactly how to make that happen. Rachel's company had a strict code of conduct, and they took workplace relationships very seriously. If they found out that she had been having an affair with someone she worked with, they wouldn't hesitate to fire her. It was a risky move, but I was past the point of caring about the consequences. I found the email address for her HR department and composed a short, anonymous message. Dear HR, I wanted to bring to your attention a situation that I believe violates company policy. One of your employees, Rachel, last name, has been engaging in an extramarital affair with a colleague. This has been going on for several months, and I believe it is affecting her work and the work environment. I thought it was important for you to know. Best regards, a concerned party. I hit send and leaned back in my chair, feeling a twisted sense of satisfaction. I didn't know if it would work, but at this point, I didn't care. The seeds of chaos had been planted, and now all I had to do was sit back and watch as her life unraveled. When the kids got home from school, I put on a smile and acted like everything was normal. I didn't want them to suspect anything, at least not yet. But every time I looked at Rachel, I felt a surge of anger and disgust. I couldn't believe that this was the woman I had married, the woman I had trusted with my heart. Over the next few days, I watched as my plan began to take effect. Rachel started getting calls and texts from her friends, and I could see the panic in her eyes as she tried to do damage control. But the more she tried to explain herself, the worse it got. The rumors spread like wildfire, and soon everyone knew the truth. Her friends began to distance themselves from her and I could see the cracks starting to form in the facade she had worked so hard to maintain. Then, one evening, Rachel came home from work looking even more distressed than usual. She walked into the living room and sat down on the couch, her face pale and drawn. They called me into HR today, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. I didn't say anything. I just waited, letting the silence hang in the air. They said they received an anonymous email about, about the affair, she continued, her voice trembling. They're launching an investigation. Mike, I could lose my job. There it was, the moment I had been waiting for. I could see the fear in her eyes, the realization that her perfect life was falling apart. But instead of feeling satisfaction, I felt, empty. The anger that had been fueling me for days was starting to fade, leaving behind a hollow ache. 
I told you there would be consequences, I said coldly, not meeting her gaze. Mike, please, she begged, tears streaming down her face. I'll do anything to fix this. I'll quit my job, I'll cut off all contact with him, whatever you want. Just please, don't do this. Don't ruin everything. I looked at her, really looked at her, for the first time in days. She was a wreck, her eyes red and swollen, her hair disheveled, her face pale and drawn. And for a moment, I felt a pang of pity for her. But then I remembered the image of her in bed with that guy, the way she had lied to me for months, and the pity evaporated. I didn't ruin anything, Rachel, I said, my voice hard. You did. You made your choices, and now you have to live with the consequences. She broke down into sobs, but I didn't comfort her. I couldn't. There was no going back from this. The life we had built together was over, and there was no saving it. I turned and walked out of the room, leaving her to cry alone on the couch. My revenge had been exacted, and now there was nothing left but the aftermath. The emptiness that followed was suffocating, and I knew that I had crossed a line that I could never uncross. But there was still one more thing left to do, one more person who needed to pay for the part they played in destroying my life. And I wasn't going to let him get away with it. The days following my confrontation with Rachel were a blur. My emotions swung between satisfaction at having torn apart her carefully crafted life and a deep, gnawing emptiness that settled in the pit of my stomach. The house was a tense, silent battlefield, with Rachel walking on eggshells around me, desperately trying to avoid further confrontation. But every time I looked at her, all I could see was the betrayal, the lies, and the image of her with that other man in our bed. I knew that getting back at Rachel wasn't enough. There was still someone else who needed to pay, someone who had the audacity to step into my life and take what wasn't his. The anger I felt toward him was a different kind of rage, cold, calculated, and relentless. He had to know that there were consequences for his actions, that he couldn't just walk away from this without suffering. I didn't know much about him, but I had managed to piece together a few details from Rachel's phone before she caught on. His name was Greg, tall, muscular, and a decade younger than me. He was the kind of guy who probably thought he could do whatever he wanted without facing any repercussions. Well, he was about to learn just how wrong he was. I spent hours thinking about how to exact my revenge. I wasn't a violent man by nature, but the thought of him getting away with everything he'd done filled me with a burning need to make him suffer. I needed to find a way to hurt him in a way that would leave a lasting mark, something that would make him regret ever crossing paths with my wife. The more I thought about it, the clearer my plan became. Greg had invaded my life, so I was going to invade his. I was going to dismantle his world piece by piece, just like he had done to mine. And I knew exactly where to start. Greg was a personal trainer at a high-end gym in town, a place frequented by people who were serious about fitness and had the money to pay for it. I had never met him, but Rachel had mentioned the gym before, and I knew it was his main source of income. If I could find a way to take that away from him, to destroy his reputation, I knew it would hit him where it hurt the most. I started by doing some digging online. I found Greg's social media profiles easily enough, pictures of him flexing at the gym, hanging out with friends, and generally living the kind of life that only a young, single guy with no real responsibilities could enjoy. It made me sick to see how carefree he was, how completely oblivious he seemed to the destruction he had caused. I knew I couldn't go after him directly without risking legal trouble, but I didn't need to. All I needed to do was plant a few seeds of doubt, to make sure that his clients and colleagues started questioning his integrity. And with the power of the internet, that was easier than ever. I created a few fake accounts on social media, using them to spread rumors about Greg. I posted on local fitness forums, claiming that he had been involved in an affair with a married woman, Rachel, of course, and that he had been using his position at the gym to seduce vulnerable clients. I suggested that he had been unprofessional, that he had crossed lines that should never be crossed, and that people should think twice before trusting him with their fitness goals. The response was almost immediate. Within days, the rumors started to spread, and I could see the fallout beginning to take effect. 
clients began to cancel their sessions with him, and the gym's management started to take notice. The gossip circulated among the gym goers, with more and more people questioning Greg's professionalism. I had struck the first blow, and it felt good, really good. But I wasn't done yet. I needed to hit him harder, to make sure that this wasn't just a minor inconvenience for him, but a full-blown disaster. I decided to take things a step further by digging into his past. I wasn't sure what I was looking for, but I was determined to find something, anything, that I could use against him. I spent hours combing through his online presence, looking for any slip-up, any hint of a scandal that I could exploit. And then I found it. Buried deep in the recesses of his social media history, I discovered a series of old posts from years ago, back when he was younger and more reckless. The posts were filled with crude jokes, inappropriate comments, and a few photos that were definitely not something you'd want your employer or clients to see. It was the kind of stuff that could easily be dismissed as youthful stupidity, but in the right context, it could be damning. I saved everything I found, screenshots, links, anything that could be used to ruin him. Then, I compiled it all into an anonymous email and sent it to the gym's management. I framed it as a concerned client who had come across these posts and was worried about the kind of person they were employing. I knew that in today's world, where reputations could be destroyed with a single tweet, this kind of information could be a death blow to Greg's career. The next day, I heard from a mutual acquaintance that Greg had been called into a meeting with the gym's management. They were investigating the claims, and there was a very real possibility that he could lose his job. The thought of him sitting in that office, sweating bullets as his bosses grilled him about his past, brought a grim smile to my face. But I wasn't done yet. I wanted to make sure that even if he managed to keep his job, his life would be a living hell. So, I started making anonymous phone calls to his clients, pretending to be someone who had been wronged by Greg. I told them that he had been involved in multiple affairs, that he had been unprofessional and manipulative, and that they should be careful about trusting him. It worked. More clients started to cancel their sessions, and word began to spread that Greg was not someone to be trusted. His reputation was in tatters, and it was only a matter of time before he would be forced to leave the gym in disgrace. But I didn't stop there. I knew where he lived, Rachel had mentioned it once in passing, and I decided to pay him a visit. I didn't plan on confronting him directly. No, I had something more subtle in mind. Late one night, after I was sure that the neighborhood was asleep, I drove over to his apartment. I parked a few blocks away and walked the rest of the distance, keeping to the shadows. When I reached his building, I found his car parked out front, a sleek, expensive vehicle that screamed, I'm better than you. It was perfect. I had come prepared. In my pocket, I carried a small container of superglue, and I made sure to coat the keyhole of his car door with it, rendering it useless. I slashed his tires for good measure, making sure that he'd have a hell of a time getting to work the next day, if he even still had a job. But that wasn't the main event. I wanted to leave him a message, something that would make it clear that he wasn't untouchable, that he wasn't going to walk away from this unscathed. So, I pulled out a can of spray paint and, in big, bold letters, I wrote across the side of his car, Homewrecker. It was crude, but it got the point across. I wanted him to wake up the next morning and see the consequences of his actions staring him in the face. I wanted him to feel the shame, the fear, the helplessness that I had felt when I found out what he had done with my wife. As I walked away from his apartment, I felt a sense of satisfaction that I hadn't felt in days. Greg's life was crumbling around him, just like mine had, and it was all because he couldn't keep his hands off another man's wife. He had taken something from me, and now I had taken something from him. The next day, I heard through the grapevine that Greg had been fired from the gym. The management had decided that the risks to their reputation were too great, and they didn't want to be associated with someone who had been involved in such a scandal. His clients had all but abandoned him, and the news of his disgrace had spread far and wide. It was exactly what I had wanted, his life in ruins, his future uncertain, all because he had made the mistake of crossing me. But as the days went on, the satisfaction I had felt began to fade, replaced by a hollow emptiness that I couldn't shake. I had gotten my revenge, but it hadn't brought me the peace I had hoped for. 
The truth was, no matter how much I had hurt Greg or Rachel, it didn't change the fact that my marriage was over, that the life I had built was gone. The revenge had been sweet in the moment, but now it felt like ashes in my mouth. And as I sat alone in my living room, the weight of everything I had done began to press down on me. I had crossed lines that I never thought I would cross, become someone I didn't recognize, all in the name of vengeance. But there was no going back now. The damage was done, and all that was left was the wreckage of what had once been my life. I had taken my revenge on Rachel and Greg, but the cost had been higher than I had ever imagined. And now, as I sat in the silence of my empty house, I realized that there was nothing left for me here. It was time to face the consequences of my actions, to decide what to do next with the pieces of my shattered life. The days following my revenge against Greg were a blur. I had crossed every line I never thought I would, and yet, I still felt empty. The satisfaction of watching Greg's life fall apart, of seeing Rachel's world crumble, had been fleeting. I had inflicted as much pain as I could, but nothing could undo the betrayal or heal the wounds that had been carved into my soul. The reality of what I had done, and what I had lost, began to settle in. My marriage was over, and there was no salvaging what remained. Rachel and I barely spoke in the days after I exacted my revenge. The tension in the house was unbearable, and the silence between us was louder than any argument we could have had. The kids, bless their innocent hearts, were oblivious to the storm brewing beneath the surface. They went about their routines, unaware that their parents were on the brink of a life-altering decision. It was a Tuesday evening when Rachel finally approached me. The kids were in bed, and the house was quiet. I was sitting in the living room, nursing a glass of whiskey, trying to drown out the thoughts that wouldn't leave me alone. Rachel entered the room cautiously, like she was approaching a wounded animal. Her face was drawn, her eyes red from days of crying, and I could see the toll this was taking on her. But I didn't feel sympathy, just a cold detachment. Mike, she began softly, her voice trembling, we need to talk. I took a long sip of my drink before responding. About what? I asked, though I already knew the answer. About us. About what happens next. She hesitated, as if she was searching for the right words. I know. I know I've hurt you in ways that I can never undo. I've destroyed our marriage, and I've betrayed you in the worst possible way. And I know that what I'm about to say might be the hardest thing we've ever had to discuss, but we can't keep going on like this. It's tearing us apart, and it's not fair to the kids. I didn't respond immediately. I just stared at the amber liquid in my glass, swirling it around as I let her words sink in. She was right, of course. We couldn't go on like this. The trust, the love, everything that had once bound us together, was gone. And the truth was, I didn't want to be with her anymore. I couldn't see her without thinking of the betrayal, without feeling the rage and hurt that had consumed me. What are you saying, Rachel? I finally asked, though I knew the answer. She took a deep breath, her eyes filling with tears. I think we need to divorce, Mike. It's the only way we can move forward, for both of us and for the kids. We need to find a way to end this, amicably, for their sake. The word, divorce, hung in the air between us, heavy and final. It wasn't a shock, I had been expecting it, dreading it, even, but hearing her say it made it real. It was like a punch to the gut, even though I knew it was the right thing to do. I set my glass down on the coffee table and looked at her, really looked at her, for the first time in days. She looked so fragile, so defeated. But I couldn't find it in myself to feel sorry for her. She had made her choices, and now we were both living with the consequences. Yeah, I said finally, my voice hollow. You're right. We can't keep doing this. We need to end it. She nodded, wiping away the tears that had begun to fall. I'm so sorry, Mike, she whispered, her voice breaking. I never wanted this to happen. I never wanted to lose you, to lose us. But you did, I replied, my tone cold and detached. You made your choice, Rachel. You chose to throw away everything we had for some fling. And now we're here, 
talking about divorce, because there's no coming back from what you did. She flinched at my words, but I didn't soften. I couldn't. I was done being the one who was hurt, the one who had to pick up the pieces. I had nothing left to give her, no forgiveness, no comfort. All I had left was the cold, hard reality of what our marriage had become. There's something else we need to talk about, she said quietly, avoiding my gaze. The kids? I think it's best if they stay with me. Her words hit me like a freight train. What? I snapped, sitting up straighter. What do you mean, they stay with you? Mike, please, she said, her voice pleading. We both know that you've been struggling, that this has been incredibly hard on you. And I know you love the kids, I know you do, but, they need stability right now. They need a parent who can be fully there for them. And you think that's you? I shot back, my anger flaring up again. After everything you've done? You think you're the better parent? It's not about who's better, Mike, she said, trying to stay calm. It's about what's best for the kids. And right now, I think they need to be with me. I'm not trying to take them away from you. We can work out a custody arrangement, but, they need to have some sense of normalcy, and I can provide that. Her words stung, but I knew there was some truth to them. I had been a wreck since finding out about the affair, and I wasn't exactly in the best place to take care of the kids. But the thought of losing them, of not being there every day, of not tucking them in at night, was unbearable. You can't just decide that on your own, I said, my voice shaking with emotion. They're my kids too, Rachel. I'm their father. And you always will be, she replied, her eyes filled with sorrow. I'm not trying to take them away from you, Mike. I'm just saying that right now, they need stability. We can figure out a custody arrangement that works for both of us, but, they need to stay with me for now. I wanted to fight her on this, to demand that the kids stay with me, but deep down, I knew she was right. I wasn't in a place to take care of them the way they needed. My emotions were all over the place, and I couldn't give them the stability they deserved. But that didn't make it any easier to accept. Fine, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. But this isn't permanent, Rachel. I'm going to get my shit together, and then we're going to revisit this. I'm not giving up my kids. She nodded, 